The following episode is sponsored by War Thunder, the free-to-play MMO for tank and plane warfare. Find out more at the end of this episode. I'm Indy Nidell, and this is another Great War on the Road special from Stomari's Airdrome in Essex in England. Now, so far in these, this series of specials, we talked about aircraft from earlier in the war and from the middle of the war. Today we're going to look at something from later in the war, uh, and by we, I mean he's going to do the talking. Could you please tell everybody out there in YouTube and TV land who you are and what you do? Certainly. My name's Dick Forsyth, and I'm the Chief Trustee of the World War I Aviation Heritage Trust which was set up in 2013 after my daughter had met a pilot in New Zealand who turned out to be the chief manager, general manager of uh, the Vintage Aviator, which makes aeroplanes for Sir Peter Jackson. And he and the pilot agreed that we could borrow some aeroplanes if I set up a trust. That's, uh, that's how it started. Uh, and now this plane behind us, what are we looking at here? This is a Sopwith Snipe. Uh, first thought of in late 1917 and um, it uh, took a wee while to get into production. They wanted various modifications to it and it eventually got into squadron service in September 1918. So just be a little bit before the end of the war. Yeah, so. about two months. Fantastic aeroplane, flies at 130 miles an hour. Its, its main uh, identifying feature is the engine behind this. Uh, Nine-cylinder rotary engine, which is the uh, uh, heralded as the, the greatest achievement of W.O. Bentley, of car fame. Really? Yeah. Oh. It, uh, <laughs> it uses almost as much oil as it uses fuel, because the oil goes straight through the cylinders and out, the, out along the fuselage. It's a, a rotary engine, so the cylinders rotate, the crankshaft stays still, it doesn't have a throttle, it has a blip switch, so you turn it on and off. Okay. Now you hear it flying, the, if we fly it this afternoon, you, it sounds like the engine stopped. It has. But you can't let it stop for too long because as it's windmilling around, it's drawing fuel into the cylinders. So if you leave it too long and then start it again, it's quite exciting. Well, how long would you ha have? And why do you, do you cut it during turns or when, when would you? you? You cut it when you want to slow down. Okay, oh, well, that makes sense. So there's sense. a little bit of mix, there, there's a mixture control, gives you a little bit of throttle like activity. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, compared to the B2, 55 miles an hour, it does everything. 130 miles an hour. This is the ultimate of the Allied fighters in World War One. Now, with the rotary engine, does it pull to one side when it flies or drives? Or it, well, it's taxis? like a big gyroscope. Yeah. If you if you know your physics theory, yeah. the, 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 if you apply a moment to the, the the gyroscope, it actually takes effect nine degrees further around in the ray of rotation. So the poor old pilot has to take all that out when he's flying along. All right. So is it was it tricky to handle or was yes, it? Yes, very. Uh, there's only one pilot allowed to fly it. Okay. Uh, it, it, because he has to be as much an engineer as he does a pilot, uh, just to understand the mechanics of what's going on in the aeroplane. So was it a more complicated and uh, longer training to use one of these than it would be for, say, a camel or something? I don't or think their training was, to... I don't think training was a great, I think if once you've flown rotary engines, so yeah. once you've been on a camel or a pup, then this was a logical step forward. Okay, and I see you've got uh, twin machine guns there. Yeah, so it's synchronized. Um, Firing through the propeller, that was by this time in the war, that was absolutely standard. But it has no brakes, it has bungee cord for suspension. Oh, wow. <laughs> and a, a, a tail skid. So the only way you can slow it down is by pulling, as you come, once you're on the ground, is pulling the stick back and putting weight on that. You can't land on tarmac or concrete because it just wears it down uh, and doesn't stop. And as you slow down, it will weathercock into wind, which, uh, unless the wind's straight down the runway, that's, uh, that's going to cause a problem. So back in the day, they didn't have runways. No, they just yeah. had open fields yeah. so that you could... Go for any direction. You go and go, and go for any direction. The, um, th there's one VC in a, in a, in a, in a sup with snipe. Yeah. A chap called Captain Barker, Canadian. Okay. He was tasked to bring one back from France to England. And bizarrely, in my time in the Air Force, if I'd been tasked to do that, I wouldn't have got one full of ammunition. 
I don't, it would just be an administrative flight back. Anyway, he took his off, decided to go for one last look at the, f at the front. Yeah. And found, I think, four Fokker D7s yeah. and shot them all down. All four of them. So this is a wow, hell of a plane. Now, how often does this go up? Twice a month in the summer months. OK. Uh, we have to do currency checks. That's one of the... So they all have to be current in flying uh, this sort of aeroplane. But John Munn, the one who's allowed to fly this one, yeah. is the chief engineer at Shuttleworth. OK. Shuttleworth being the, the largest vintage collection in, in UK. But he also flies a lot of the aeroplanes, so he, he sort of helps me run the piloting side. And Jonathan Martin Hale is flying that one, and he's an airline pilot, but he also owns this aeroplane, okay. which is the Isaac's Fury. And what do, you, do you have any plans for the near future, uh, for expansion? Or? We're currently limited because the one thing that Stone Maris doesn't have is, is a hangar. Ah, uh, yeah. So they have, they, they're, they're trying really hard to find the funds to build a hangar. Okay. And then I'm hoping that I'm optimistic that we might be persuade New Zealand to send some more aeroplanes over, and that would. So I have my sort of my wish list is a DH2, okay, pusher, yeah, and the FE, okay, the, the, which is yeah, which we've we've seen and we talked about them before. Yeah. Oh, well, you can. Yeah, the FE with the, the, the bigger pusher, 50 foot wingspan, yeah, and with a poor old gunner in the front, uh, having to stand and aim over the pilot to fly behind them. So it, it was, it was uh, yes, after the B2 really, yeah. but before things like the, before the DH2 and the, the more modern pups and camels. And I have to say, I love your outfit. <laughs> yeah, this is a Sidcock flying suit. Um, as we got to 1917, the, uh, the aeroplanes like the SE5 um, could go to 20,000 feet. No oxygen. Yeah and very cold. Yeah. So they used to cover themselves in whale grease. Yeah, and this is a... And, and the, 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 these are just... Whale grease too. Yeah, Sorry. to sort of... Whale grease uh, yeah. Stop Sorry. getting, getting frostbite. And these were just used to, to wipe the goggles because this and that one particularly, they, 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 they're the total oil loss systems. Yeah, we, now we've talked about it and we've seen that. Was that less of an issue by later in the war or was that still just you know the oil? I think it's just a function of the the geography of the cockpit so yeah. the, the pilot's well in there yeah and the, the oil okay. I, I saw it yesterday that the wing was covered in oil because it just goes out of the tank through the engine and out wow and it uses uh, 11 liters of oil uh, an hour at seven pounds fifty an hour so if anybody wants to help help us along that um, money is always a challenge now, you talked about the, 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 the speed that this could fly, but what kind of range did it have? I mean, how far, how, with how much oil? Two miles a minute, two and a, two and a bit hours. So okay. we're talking 250 miles to tanks dry sort of thing. Okay. Oh. Uh, something of that order. I love the lift here sign. So you can really see that these things do not weigh a ton. Well, yes, it, it, you need to be aware that most of it's linen, Yeah. Irish linen. Uh, They've been very specific about the weave and the strength. So the, every item of this is taken from 1917 drawings oh, right. and exactly replicated, which is why it's a challenge on a day like today or any day. What people probably don't realize is that more RFC crews lost their lives from accidents than they did from combat. Oh, there you have it. So I think the total is something like 14,000 crew died and 8,000 were due to training. All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Not at all. And now Not we're going to have a look at the clothing that the pilots wore. Uh, Trevor, can you tell everybody uh, a little bit about yourself, who you are and what you do? Mm, certainly, yes. Uh, my name's Trevor Poole. I'm the uh, chairman of uh, a living history society called the Great War Society. Which you should look up. Uh, indeed so, yes, www.thegreatwarsociety.com. Um, we also have a Facebook page. Um, we are the premier living history society recreating um, primarily First World British Infantry, um, but there is a small number within the society um, who have a, a, a penchant and enthusiasm for the Royal Flying Corps. So we're also able to portray Royal Flying Corps troops from um, the First World War, which is eminently suited to such places as Royal Flying Corps Stone Maris. All right, and you are a pilot. For us. I am, yeah. yes, okay. yes indeed. And could you tell us a bit about the pilot's kit and maybe the evolution of, mm. of 
how it started and where it went? So the flying clothing of the First World War had its origins in the motoring clothing of uh, that particular period. Right. So the stout leather coats, the motoring caps, the goggles were all, um, they translated very, very nicely into protecting um, an airman um, whilst on operations. What is actually worn underneath the flying clothing is your generic uniform. So it could be an officer's uniform, it might be a sergeant's uniform. Um, but the, the normal service uniform is worn under the clothing and you will have, as I'm demonstrating here, um, a heavy leather motoring coat um, which is equipped with um, a handy pocket on the front so that you can carry um, the all-important maps, um, a notepad which is, uh, is also useful because sometimes you might want to sort of write things down um, and record what you've observed from the air, um, not necessarily in the air but perhaps a little later while it's fresh on your mind, you get back on the ground and write it all down. Um, very, very handy pocket is also good for George here. Uh, George is the... Uh, of course he's George. He is George, <laughs> named after the king. Who, yeah. who, who else? Yeah. Um, my childhood bear, who um, is um, he's about 59 hours airborne. He comes everywhere with me, and, and he saw me through three months in France last year. Um, a bringer of great luck. And we, we do place a considerable um, store in mascots and lucky charms. So most pilots would bring some sort of mascot? or a Some charm? sort of mascot, yes. So okay. a bear, maybe a, a, an item of clothing from a, a sweetheart or a loved oh, one, okay. um, or some sort of childhood toy, or just a picture of a loved one or family member. Um, and a, a lot of it is down to luck. Yeah. Um, you don't want to take too much into the air. Take everything that's necessary and, 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 and nothing that is not. Um, there's always the prospect of some sort of perhaps mechanical failure or enemy action that might bring you down close to or on the wrong side of the enemy line, so you want to be able to defend yourself, um, hence the, um, the Mark VI Webley service revolver. And this so you won't lose it? This so you won't lose it. Yes, called a lanyard. Um, if you get into a punch-up and you have to let go of the revolver, you've still got the revolver and you can pick it up and bring it back into use. Well, which necessary. revolver is this? It's the Mark VI Webley um, from 1915. Um, it's a handsome gun. Very handsome gun, uh, 455 calibre, which okay. was the standard revolver calibre of the time. Uh, and once again, as an officer, I have to basically self-finance, so everything I use or wear or carry, I have to acquire, um, which I can do, because usually I'll have a, a private income. So the revolver is my responsibility. It doesn't matter whether it's a Colt or Webley like this it's or a Smith & Wesson, as long as it's 455 government calibre, it's uh -huh. up to you. You have to, officers have to acquire um, a wristwatch, um, that's in the regulations, that's in the field service regulations. All the uniform, all the weaponry, all the clothing is acquired by myself. Um, other essentials to flying, apart from um, a suitable flying helmet and the, the, the protective goggles, will be some sort of um, flying gauntlets, usually in leather, um, possibly fur, so that might be um, seal skin, uh, it might be, um, uh, well, there's one example that we've got over at our display, which is uh, black bear skin. Okay. Um, all original items from the time. Um, I always take a hip flask of single malt scotch into the air as well. Um, I take one everywhere. Uh, well, I don't. Okay. All right, I, I will admit. So do I. Um, protective clothing is 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 calculated to keep you warm. So is this. Um, How, is this very warm? How warm is this? Is um, it, it 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 works. It works. I mean, it's quite warm on a day like today when you're on the ground, not doing much. Um, but as um, it, it certainly translates well into the air. And the idea is obviously to um, to keep the blood from flowing away from your extremities because you know hands and feet are, are essential in controlling uh, and flying an aeroplane um, and when you get cold the blood tends to move away from the extremities towards the yeah. vital organs to keep you alive it's, just, it's as simple as that but having flown in the B2 um, in this kit uh, I can honestly say that it, 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 it does work oh, yeah. um, it's as, it, it works today just as it did a hundred years ago now regarding the maps let's say you were flying in, in, mm -hmm. the, in this in this snipe for example uh, how difficult was it to, to actually use the maps at that speed, at that altitude, with an open cockpit? In an open cockpit, in a single seat open cockpit <laughs> where you're flying the aircraft. With two machine guns to control as well. Yeah, <laughs> I, absolutely. Well, I, 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 you know, if, if you're engaging an enemy and, and having to deal with them and, and operate the machine guns, then obviously you, you wouldn't be too bothered about the map. map yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously for argument's sake, if you were flying along trying to perhaps orientate yourself or spot something on the ground and, and use the map, quite difficult. Um, because you, unlike perhaps an observer in something like the B2 where you've just got your job to you do, do yeah. and the pilot's the driver and that's his responsibility, 
quite difficult. Now, did it did during the war did did this evolve to be something more standardized, or was it really still up to the individual pilot what he wanted to wear? Uh, yes, it was. It was up to the individual pilot what he wanted to wear, but I think perhaps the choice of clothing um, was uh, perhaps a little more expansive as the war went on. We've spoken earlier on uh, in, at our display about the, the, the one-piece fur-lined Sidcot suit. Okay. Um, that was something that wasn't invented until you know early 1917, so that's fairly oh, yeah. late into the war. But again, commercially available. And certainly with, um, with the officer, you, you could basically have bespoke clothing. Um, there's a, um, a Sidcot suit, for example, in the Royal Air Force Museum that's not lined with imitation teddy bear fur. It's lined with leopard skin because that particular officer has gone to his outfitter and said, will you line it with leopard, leopard skin? skin. <laughs> so, um, so it's a combination, really. Um, but, you know, the, the, because flying was a new thing, flying clothing was a new thing, what the authorities would do would, you know, they, they would canvass the aircrew and say what really works for you and make that selection of that particular coat, that particular pair of gauntlets, and then say that is now our official pattern for issue to the Flying Corps and obviously the Royal Air Force later on. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up because we have incoming aircraft. Trevor, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. It's been a pleasure. I, I, it really it's has, actually. And uh, there's a link to their website in the description so you can check it out, and you really should because it's really cool. And before you do finish, can I also say that, um, that as well as chairman of the Great War Society, I'm also um, a patron of the World War One Aviation Heritage Trust, who have their own website and it is courtesy of them that we have these wonderful um, aircraft here at Stow Marish today, the Sopwith Snipe and the B2. And these planes are going to go up in a few minutes, so we're going to cut it off so we can see that. Uh, if you'd like to see our episode about Bloody April, you can click right here for that. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. We'd like to thank Dick and Trevor for giving us an insight into the Sopwith Snipe and the flying gear of World War I pilots. Now, as I said in the beginning, this episode is sponsored by War Thunder, a free-to-play combat simulator where you can become a pilot of an iconic World War II or Cold War fighter or bomber. So, if you want to take the helm of something that makes the Sopwith Snipe look like a flying rust bucket, you can follow the link in the description. Pick an iconic plane and take to the sky. And by doing so, you will also be supporting our show.